Mm. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Council Member Cabrera and Council Member Perkins. Council Member Jonah was just here, as well as Council, Council Member Espinal. On April 11, 1968, seven days after the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., President Lyndon Johnson signed into law Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, commonly known as the Fair Housing Act. The legislation was co-sponsored by then-Senators Edward Brooke and Walter Mondale and advanced an ambitious and progressive vision to eliminate housing discrimination and residential segregation in this country. As envisioned, the Fair Housing Act is an important tool for achieving both justice and equity. In signing the bill, President Johnson proclaimed that long last, fair housing for all is now a part of the American way of life. We've come sort of the way, but not near all of it. Today marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, and our hearing today is aimed at advancing policies that move us closer to being a city where fair housing and opportunity are the norm in all communities. Fair housing is not just an important tool for eliminating discrimination. It also helps to strengthen families, communities, businesses, and our overall country. Fulfillment of the letter and the spirit of the law means that every community can be a place of opportunity where people can live in diverse, inclusive, accessible neighborhoods with quality schools, healthy foods, meaningful jobs, health care, green spaces, quality credit, and the other opportunities that frame and affect our lives. Today, we'll hear three bills related to the city's creation and preservation of affordable housing. Intro 601, which will require the mayor to submit an annual fair affordable housing plan to the council. Intro 607, which will require that any plan developed by the city for the creation and preservation of affordable housing be created in a manner that affirmatively further is fair housing, and intro 722, which will require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, known as HPD, to annually report on expiring affordable housing units to the Council. Uh, briefly, and in a few moments, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson will speak on the intro of these bills. I'd like to remind everyone who'd like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant, and we'll be sticking to a three-minute clock for all public testimony. I will now have... Um, the uh, oath administered. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Uh, before you begin your testimony, if you could just identify yourselves for the record. Layla Bozorg, Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Strategies at HPD. Matthew Murphy, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Strategy at HPD. Molly Park, Deputy Commissioner for Development at HPD. You can begin, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Cornegy, Speaker Johnson, and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. My name is Matt Murphy, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Strategy for the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, which I'll refer to as HPD. I'm joined today by Layla Bozorg, Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Strategies, and Molly Park, Deputy Commissioner for Development. Thank you for the invitation to testify on the topic of fair housing and on the three bills presented today. Introduction 601, which would require the submission and reporting of, on an affordable housing plan to the Council. Introduction 607, which would require that the city's affordable housing plan must affirmatively further fair housing, and introduction 722, which would require HPD to annually report on expiring affordable housing units. As Mayor de Blasio shared at his State of the City address earlier this year, we are working to make New York City the fairest big city in America. Fair housing is critical to this vision. We know that New York City is a city of opportunity, but this opportunity is not shared equally by all New Yorkers due to historical and contemporary injustices, which includes the legacy of housing discrimination and segregation. Where New Yorkers live impacts their access to jobs, economic opportunity, education, safety, public transit, health outcomes, and other important opportunity indicators, which is why it's critical that our affordable housing investments work to foster inclusive communities, promote fair housing choice, 
and increase access to opportunity for all New Yorkers. As the chair mentioned, tomorrow marks the 50 year anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act. On April 11, 1968, the federal government passed the legislation as a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Fair Housing Act, among other reforms, outlawed housing discrimination and required municipalities to take actions to affirmatively further fair housing. The 1968 Fair Housing Act protects people against discrimination when they are renting, buying, or securing financing for any housing based on seven federally protected classes, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and the presence of children. This federal law is strengthened by the New York State Human Rights Law and the New York City Human Rights Law, which include additional protected classes like source of income, age, sexual orientation, and military status. Every five years, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, required municipalities and regions under this obligation to, to conduct and publish an analysis of impediments to assess the remaining impediments to fair housing choice. In 2015, President Obama's administration updated guidance on obligations to affirmatively further fair housing, known as the AFFH Final Rule. The AFFH Rule addresses a historic absence of regulatory guidance on fair housing by clarifying and strengthening the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. According to this rule, AFFH means taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected class characteristics. In addition, these new guidelines require jurisdictions receiving federal funds to conduct an expanded evaluation known as the Assessment of Fair Housing, or AFH, in order to continue to receive federal funding. The 2015 AFFH rule outlines a balanced approach to clarify how jurisdictions can take meaningful actions to promote fair housing. A balanced approach means that cities pursue what are called mobility and place-based strategies. Mobility strategies include increasing the availability of affordable housing, including mixed income housing in areas of opportunity, such as through targeted siting, new construction, and the removal of existing regulatory barriers. Place-based strategies include building, rehab building rehabilitation as a part of a concerted community revitalization effort, new construction of mixed income housing, and coordinated investments in housing, schools, transit, healthcare, and other amenities to increase access to opportunity. On the ground, this balanced approach means creating and preserving affordable housing area, uh, sorry, on the ground, this balanced approach means creating and preserving affordable housing in areas with good schools, public transportation, and access to other community assets, and ensuring that neighborhoods long neglected by the private market, such as Brownsville or Far Rockaway, get the public investments and opportunities they need to thrive. Under Housing New York, the city is committed to pursuing both of these, both of these strategies to expand housing choice. So earlier this year, um, HUD, under the current President Trump, delayed implementation of the required assessment of fair housing. The due date uh, was pushed back five years for most jurisdictions, meaning that New York City's assessment of fair housing, which was previously due in 2019, would now not be required until 2024. And our 2019 analysis would re revert back to the, to the suggestions HUD made um, guidance in 1996, that's the analysis of impediments. We believe that delaying the implementation of AFFH um, undermines an important tool to keep cities accountable to addressing decades of discrimination. So regardless of delays at the national level, the City of New York remains committed to data-driven, collaborative, fair housing planning process. And we've formalized this process into an initiative we're calling Where We Live NYC which will address the same issues and content of the assessment of fair housing and culminate in a final public report. Through this process, we will also deepen our analysis to focus on fair housing challenges re relevant to New York City as a high cost city. As the city of New York, we take seriously our obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. We are working to combat individual housing discrimination and we are ensuring our housing and community development 
investments are creating greater access to opportunity and housing choice. So building on the work that we already do, we see Where We Live NYC as a critical step in furthering fair housing. Where We Live NYC represents a comprehensive fair housing planning process to study, understand, and address patterns of residential segregation and concentrated poverty in our neighborhoods and how these patterns impact New Yorkers' access to opportunity, including jobs, education, safety, public transit, and positive health outcomes. Where We Live NYC will include extensive community part participation throughout all aspects of the process, as well as data and policy analysis that will culminate with the release of a public report in the fall of 2019. The report will include measurable goals and strategies that are designed to foster inclusive communities, promote fair housing choice, and increase access to opportunity for all New Yorkers. These goals and strategies will consider all existing and new policies related to the allocation of housing resources and other investments. We see this as a unique opportunity for us to zoom out from discussing individual development projects or land use actions with the ultimate purpose of promoting fair housing and equitable access to opportunity for all New Yorkers. So HPD will be leading a robust and inclusive engagement process to collect meaningful input from stakeholders, including community organizations and neighborhood residents to inform this work. We want to better understand how fair housing issues play out in the lives of New Yorkers with a focus on seeking out populations protected by fair housing law, as well as populations, communities and neighborhoods that historically have been left out of government decision making. We've div divided our engagement process into three key phases. We'll start with what we call the learn phase, which is gonna set the groundwork for the Where We Live NYC planning process. It's an opportunity for members of our stakeholder group, representing a broad spectrum of experts, including community-based organizations, research organizations, and community development professionals, to respond to, to our initial data, discuss existing conditions, and identify and prioritize factors that contribute to fair housing issues um, in the city today. The learn phase will be taking place this spring and summer. Next, we'll enter into what we're calling the create phase. This is an opportunity for stakeholders to share ideas for policy solutions based on the information we'll be collecting and the con contributing factors that were pr prioritized during the learn phase. Fin uh, then the create phase is gonna be taking place this fall. In 2019, we'll transition to what we're calling the finalized phase, which will be our chance to share how the public input um, and stakeholder input was used to set policy goals and strategies. It's also an opportunity for the stakeholder group and the public to let us know if we've got it right and to make final suggestions before we submit the report in, uh, later in 2019. So to be clear, the city does not have a predetermined outcome for this process. We'll be working with our partners to examine and understand priority issues and policies and develop goals and strategies to implement moving forward. All of us at HPD look forward to having meaningful and candid conversations with our partners, including all of you, throughout this process and working together to make our city stronger, fairer, and more equitable. Now I'll turn to the legislation, beginning with Introduction 607, and I want to thank Councilmember Richards, the primary sponsor of this legislation. HPD supports Intro 607. As I have testified to, HPD is obligated to affirmatively further fair housing, and this will help hold us to this commitment. The changes under the current presidential administration show that the federal government is likely working to, con to dismantle key provisions of the Fair Housing Act. Therefore, it is critical that cities such as ours uphold our goals and realize our vision and the vision of the civil rights leaders of the 1960s. I wanna thank the city council for stepping up and showing the federal government that New York City will always be a place where housing discrimination is taken seriously and where our attempts to combat it and to further fair housing are significant and meaningful. I will now speak to introduction 601, which would require the submission of and reporting of an on an affordable housing plan to the council. I want to thank Speaker Johnson, the primary sponsor of this legislation. HPD supports transparency around our affordable housing plan, Housing New York, and we support the intent of this bill to do just that. We are tremendously proud of the work we have done over the past four years to build and preserve more homes with deeper levels of affordability. Every quarter, HPD re reports information about our production, both preservation and new construction, to ensure that the public has access to information about the work that we do. We include in this data set information about location, income level, plan tax incentives, and number of units, among other data points. 
HPD also puts yearly citywide targets for project starts and completions in the mayor's management report, which reflect trends that we anticipate when it comes to housing production. We look forward to working with the council on language to ensure that any reporting we do is meaningful, feasible, and protects the confidentiality of the vulnerable populations in our support of housing. Finally, I'll turn to introduction 722, also, spon also sponsored by Speaker Johnson, which would require HPD to annually report on affordable housing units subject to regulatory agreements or other affordability agreements that are expiring within two and a half years after the audit date. HPD supports the intent of this bill with regards to tracking regulatory agreements with particular attention to those agreements that are nearing the end of their terms of affordability. Throughout HPD's ex existence, there has not been a centralized database to track specific data from regulatory agreements and other documents with affordability requirements, such as the year of expiration. All such documents are housed on ACRIS, the Department of Finance's database of recorded documents, but that portal is limited in terms of search capabilities, sorting, and other techn technological functions. Further, the complex and varied nature of the regulatory agreements reached throughout the past few decades make standardization an extremely difficult task. For example, you may see a new construction project financed with a 15-year home written agreement, low-income housing tax credits, which have a 30-year compliance period, two 40-year mortgages, one with HPD and one with the Housing Development Corporation, a 75-year ground, ground lease with the New York City Housing Authority, and 20% of the units as permanently affordable. These financing tools rely on different lengths of time by rule and purpose. Given the complexity, the amount of time and staff needed to conduct a review of this type required in the legislation is extensive. For the past few years, HPD has engaged in planning to upgrade many of our data tracking systems including plans to equip our systems with the kind of capabilities envisioned by Introduction 722. This particular plan has three prongs, standardization, modernization, and recapture. First, I will discuss standardization. HPD has historically used and continues to use a variety of regulatory documents for affordable housing, each of which may take different forms and may overlap in a single project. This makes tracking data points like expiration dates very difficult. While we need a certain degree of flexibility for drafting regulatory documents for each project, HPD is currently reviewing the various documents we use to identify ways to make common data points more standardized. Next, I will discuss modernization. Regulatory agreements touch several divisions with HPD, including development, legal, construction monitoring, marketing, and asset management. In the past several years, HPD has worked to secure funding to integrate the department's respective data systems and house shared data in a centralized repository to allow us to better track projects throughout their full life cycles. Finally, HPD is in the midst of the first stages of an extensive recapture process. HPD's Asset Management Division has begun a process to research historic regulatory agreements and other documents, an effort that requires significant additional resources including staff members with specific training to research and extract data for each project. Separately, HPD is concerned that the disclosure requirements linked to expiring regulatory agreements and plans for their preservation could lead to speculation by predatory developers. HPD works extensively with the projects in our portfolio to preserve their affordability for the long term. Beyond initial terms of affordability, we conduct active outreach to older projects, work with those in need of financial assistance, and engage in other aspects of strategic preservation that help us keep as much housing affordable as possible. HPD would like to work with the council to ensure that we are preserving affordable housing in a manner that does not encourage speculation. As you can see, HPD has invested significant time and resources over the past couple of years to address the historic problems with tracking re regulatory information. We are committed to standardizing and modernizing our system for the future while ensuring that we recapture the information that may have been overlooked in the past. We look forward to working with you towards expanding on our plan to take HPD's regulatory tracking system into the 21st century. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on these bills. I look forward to answering any questions with my colleagues you have at this time. 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, we've been joined by Council Members Chin, Rivera, Landa, and uh, Council Member Williams. Um, I'm going to begin by framing dialogue that we've had with your office around uh, trying, attempting to compile uh, a robust look at all the affordable housing units uh, in the city of New York. Um, I'm attempting to do that in my district, and I think most districts around uh, would love to have that data as an assessment tool. Um, so can you provide the council a breakdown on how many new units have been created by the Housing New York plan, both under the original plan and Housing New York 2.0? Uh, and before you answer that, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, if the seamless way that you've shared your testimony today is any indication of the way HP HPD intends to implement programs and work collaboratively with the city council, we're in for a pleasant uh, time. Thank you, council member. Um, we have to date financed 87,557 units under Housing New York. Uh, we consider Housing New York. I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you say the number again? Sure, 87,557 units. Uh, of those units, 28,492 are new construction and 59,065 are preservation. Uh, that is Housing New York in its total. Uh, 2.0 reflects some updated programs, but we considered it to be all one plan. Thank you. So in that particular portfolio, can you cite examples of affordable housing built in the last five years that are affordable to extremely low? I don't know if you have this breakdown, but extremely low, very low, or low-income households built in transit-rich neighborhoods. And I think we all know what that's called for. Uh, transit-rich opportunity transit-rich neighborhoods of opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, one project that I'd like to call out in particular was, is a new construction project that we financed last year uh, on the grounds of the NYCHA Fulton Houses. Uh, it is, it's about 160 units. 20% of those will be for very low-income households. Another 30% of those will be for low-income households. It's a building, it's a block and change from the High Line. It's a fantastic location. Uh, another project that I would point out is the Gilbert. It's on First Avenue, just a couple of blocks from the start of the Second Avenue subway. It's got 16 extremely low-income units, 38 very low-income units, and 49 low-income units. We have many other projects that we have uh, started that leverage inclusionary housing and 421A to be able to do low-income units in very high-income neighborhoods. Uh, 625 West 57th Street, for example, has 142 low-income units. Um, the Essex Crossing sites that we have financed over the last few years have, have low-income and very low-income units as well. Uh, I could keep going, but um, I think you get the idea. I, I do, uh, and since we have that uh, kind of framework and context. I know in my district and a lot of districts across the city, um, there's a call for this wide range of affordability, which actually includes pathways to home ownership. And we've had this conversation ongoing with your office. If you could cite for me as well, one or two of the programs around, centered around pathways uh, to home ownership through HPD. And if you could cite the amount of units that are earmarked for uh, purchase or for uh, affordable home ownership that you have in your portfolio? Sure. 10% uh, of the Housing New York plan is targeted to homeowners. Uh, I need to, I will double check on the exact number that we have started thus far. Um, to date, the majority of the home ownership units have been in the preservation programs, but I am extremely excited to announce that we just last month launched the Open Door program, which is new construction for of co-op and condos. We closed the first project last month. We have a robust pipeline going forward, and I think we'll be expanding the universe of home ownership opportunities going forward. Um, just if you could cite for me uh, any number or range in terms of the, the amount of units. It has, it's in the range of nine or 10,000 units of home ownership that we have done thus far, but we can get back to you with the exact number. Thank you, but the percentage was 10%? 10%. Thank you, we've been joined by Councilmember Torres, and I'm going to, on my second round, ask more questions. Oh, and Councilmember Rosenthal, uh, but I'll allow for my colleagues who have very busy schedules to engage in some questions right now, beginning with Councilmember Lander. Sorry about that. 
<laughs> no, it's awesome to just do that like that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well done, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I'm sorry, Councilmember Landa, question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for uh, convening this hearing and, uh, um, and taking up this really important issue. Obviously, you know, it, here we are one day before the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, which was passed, you know, just seven days after Dr. King was killed as a, as a living part of his legacy. And, and I appreciate the attention you're bringing this, and I appreciate the attention that the HPD team is bringing. And, and this is a, a great team, so I really am enthusiastic about all three of your work and about Commissioner Torres Springer. Um, I guess I do want to start with the with the m more troubling note, which is you know like all of our responsibility, and not the folks in this room, that we don't approach the 50th anniversary in a good shape on uh, segregation and integration in New York City. Um, you know the most nor the most common measure, this dissimilarity index, says that 82 percent of New Yorkers would have to move to have an integrated city where most cities have actually, from 1980 to 2010, made meaningful progress, um, and the average American uh, dissimilarity index fell from 73.1% to 59.4% from 1980 to 2010. Ours has stayed stuck where it is. So um, I think we need to like, you know, step into this conversation understanding we are, though we are one of the most diverse big cities in America, we're also one of the most segregated big cities in America, and the consequences of that are not um, trivial or vestigial or historic, they are, as, as you know, and as people in this room know, and many people better than me, you know, it, 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 the consequence of segregation in our neighborhoods and in our schools is blocked upward social mobility, and neighborhoods like mine, like Park Slope, that are whiter and wealthier, have great public schools, have great transit, have lovely parks, have good services, and unfortunately, in so many neighborhoods of color and low-income neighborhoods, those things aren't there, and we reproduce in each generation the consequences of inequality. And like, it's not easy for white New Yorkers to accept that segregation is a form of hoarding privilege. Um, but that is the reality in the city. So I'm glad that we're here today talking about the need to have a, that we're united, council and, and HPD and the administration, on the fact that we have to carry forward in this planning process. But I want to pat us ourselves on the back too much. We are starting from a place that is really like a fundamental violation of Dr. King's core dream, and we keep reproducing it all the time. And that's not narrowly on the people at this table, or uh, we all are doing it in our individual choices, and I'll just own this for myself and where I live and where my kids go to school, and you know, in our public policies. Uh, there's this great book by Richard Rothstein that I urge people to read, The Color of Law, which just demonstrates our, we made public policy choices in housing and education and transportation and infrastructure that produced a segregated country and a segregated city. And if we want to go the other direction, we're gonna have to make hard public policy choices to go the other way. So this process is an opportunity and I'm uh, wholeheartedly supporting each of these bills. I am, uh, I've got today a report that some of you are uh, partners on, including you, uh, Mr. Chair, that outlines 12 steps that if we could get past denial uh, might help us move toward a desegregated city. And I guess I just want to, I know the planning process, you want to have a real planning process, so you don't start with ideas, but I will just mention a couple of the things that we recommend. And step one is having this process, so it's a good start. Um, but I guess I just offer three things. You know, we offer the idea of making sure that as we're doing inclusionary neighborhood rezonings, we're not only rezoning low-income neighborhoods like East New York or East Harlem or the South Bronx, but whiter and wealthier neighborhoods. If inclusionary is gonna be a tool for integration, it has to be in higher income neighborhoods. Um, we recommend fighting discrimination in the co-op marketplace. This really addresses the issue of home ownership and wealth building where we aren't currently able to do testing and we need some new legislation. And the, the third broad idea is just to make sure that it's not only about housing policy. Um, this, you mentioned in your testimony the connections to education and health and transportation but there are so many things we need to do in education and health and transportation policy, and I hope this will be an opportunity uh, that the plan, A, it won't just be a plan, it'll really be an agenda of, of action, and B, that it will connect to all those other systems where we're also gonna need to make change if we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you, Councilman, and 
thank you for putting together a report. I think it, it lays out the, um, the issues quite well, and I encourage everyone to take a look. Um, and the suggestions that are laid out are also things that we kind of expect to be surfaced through the process. Um, not many people realize that the rules changed recently. Um, and the 2015 rule change I referred to uh, under President Obama was significant and progressive. Um, and so the concern is that, that the promises of fair housing or the expectations of fair housing don't actually get realized because it's one step forward, one step back. And we don't wanna be in that position. What we wanna do is take advantage of this moment, take advantage of the 2015 rule change, build on it, and the, the process that Commissioner Gorzler laid out um, in terms of where we live, we feel like is a very good opportunity to, to take that step. Um, so the suggestions that in your report um, are exactly the kinds of things we expect to come out. And I'll make clear as well that what we, as Councilman Lander pointed out, the, one of the values of the uh, rule change was that there's more concrete goals and strategies than there were, um, than HUD asked of before. And I, I think that's a tremendous value because it actually shows that while we have a, um, a complicated starting place that over the short, medium, and long term, we're understanding the issue, understanding what's contributing to the issue, and building in that into the process, and then working to chip away at it by taking meaningful actions. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a follow-up question, but I'm happy to wait till the end of the Thank you. I was just going to suggest okay. that you yeah, uh, wait on a to the I'll second round. Around. And uh, the next person up is my predecessor, Councilmember Williams. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So he's deferred to Councilmember Chen. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, in my district, in Lower Manhattan, uh, especially in areas of uh, Barry Park City and even some in the financial district, there were a small amount of affordable housing that was built. Um, but I'm not sure if the city is tracking it because constituents now are coming to my office and said now they're getting notices from their landlord that they have to leave within a year, uh, that the, the apartment is no longer under a certain program. We had a whole series of those what was 421G um, that a lot of people didn't even know that they were moving into an apartment that had that type of protection until it was too late. Um, so right now, what we're dealing with is some of these programs might have been 80-20s, um, with 20% were affordable. This was in Barry Park City, and now the 20 years are up. And then we also have landlords who are trying to keep the affordability, telling um, the resident, but then now they're gonna charge, they're gonna do preferential rent. So what we have the situation is that resident who helped build up the neighborhood in the early days are now being forced to leave. And some of these are not low income housing, right? They're actually either middle or moderate income housing. And so how do the city, um, what can HPD do to make sure that resident who helped build up these neighborhood who actually lived through 9-11 but remained there um, and fight and want to stay. And now some of them are seniors and they're, they're, forced, they're forced to leave. So in terms of preserving the affordable housing and, and making sure that the, in, the, the neighborhood keep that diversity. Um, so what is, what is HPD uh, doing in terms of some of that type of housing? Sure, let me start by saying we are deeply committed to affordable housing preservation. I mentioned earlier that about 59,000 of our Housing New York starts to date are preservation, and of that, two thirds, or about 40,000 units, are uh, units in buildings that had previously existing HPD or other regulatory agreements. So maintaining the stock of affordable housing that we already have is critically important to the success of Housing New York and to protecting the tenants that you're talking about. Um, I want to pause for a minute on 421G. That was a very specific and very um, 
narrow program as written by the state government, so I, I think maybe we can circle back offline on that one. Uh, more generally, we do do a lot of outreach to owners. Um, I think the, the fact that property tax exemptions by definition expire is actually a very valuable tool for us. Um, it is challenging for owners to continue um, operating when they do have to pay full property taxes. So that is a, a critical leverage point that we use to engage with owners. We do proactive outreach based on when exemptions are going to be expiring. We do proactive outreach um, based on geography. We, um, but I also want to mention, you, you mentioned that people were getting notices saying that they had to leave. Everything that is going through HPD financing programs, and again, I'm going to set 421G aside just because I, I'm not familiar enough with the specifics of that particular program to, to talk on the record today. But everything that we do through our normal financing programs is rent regulated, which provides an added layer of assistance. Um, I think the track record that I mentioned indicates that we do a very good job of keeping programs in official affordable housing programs. But even if a building does exit, the existing tenant should be protected. So it does sound like there is some potential tenant harassment issues that we could follow up with you on. Yeah, we appreciate that. We, I guess we have reached out to HPD, but we want to follow up, making sure that a lot of these residents will be able to continue to stay in the neighborhood that they helped to build. And we don't want uh, the property owner, the landlord, to use it as a harassment tool to try to get rid of these long-term tenants and to be able to charge market rent. And that the whole issue of preferential rent, I think our chair has uh, is very, a lot of interest on that, that we have to figure out how do we protect tenants and not allow, you know, because the way the preferential rent set up is something that we need the state to help uh, change that. But we definitely could discuss more offline because I want to make sure that the affordable units in neighborhood where there are high income and mixed income, we want to make sure that the working families can continue to stay there. Agreed. We'll follow up with you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for, for your testimony. Uh, obviously, it was already discussed the connection between uh, Dr. King and, and the passage of legislation. Uh, very often, we talk about the, the flowery language that Dr. King uh, used, and I just wanted to read uh, some additional quotes that people not have known that were after his depression and close to uh, when he lost his life. There was a great article about it in last week's Time magazine. Uh, he said, we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult be today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. Negroes generally live in worse slums today than 20 or 25 years ago. In the North, schools are more segregated today than they were in 1954. The unemployment rate among whites at one time was about the same as the unemployment rate among Negroes. But today, the unemployment rate among Negroes is twice that of whites, and the average income of the Negro is today 50% less than whites. Now, some of those things we don't know if we'd be reading uh, in the 60s or in 2018. Uh, also, uh, he talked about Negroes having proceeded uh, from a premise that equality means what it says, and they have taken white Americans at their word when they talked of, of it as an objective. But most whites in America proceed from a premise that equality is a loose expression for improvement. White America is not even psychologically organized to close the gap. Essentially, it seeks only to make it less painful and less obvious, but in most respects, to retain it. I think those are powerful words because it describes the difficulties that we have uh, in all of these conversations. It's easy to talk about it in theory, but we really need to get down to the heart and make the changes. Um, I'm not even sure if it's just white America. I think people in general, uh, uh, I don't know if psychologically have grasped what that means and the difficulty at task um, and at hand of these tasks. With that said, uh, we have uh, the responsibility to move the ball forward. And so I just want to say I'm excited that these pieces of legislation are before us, and I just want to thank the chair and the sponsors for that, and thank you for testifying. Um, they're all important. I did want to focus a little bit on intro number 722. Um, I, I didn't read the testimony, so I apologize. That one was important to me as a tenant organizer uh, way back before anybody knew what it was, before our President Obama. Uh, and my mother was very worried that I would never be able to pay the bills. Um, we, had, we, we, we ran from building to building as we found out 
that the buildings were up, whether it's Section 8 or Mitchell Lama, and that was a very haphazard way of doing it. And so I really wanted to drill in to figure out uh, what the issues you have the, the bill, because I think that information would be very useful to organizers who want to have a, a concrete way of addressing um, the buildings before it's too late. We're never going to build our way out of the problem, so uh, we have to do whatever we can to restore uh, what we have. And I also want to see, uh, second question, if uh, you've been tracking, I'm sure you have, the disbursement of affordable units uh, in the housing plan, and if you've seen them at all concentrated in particular neighborhoods. Sure. Uh, let me start with uh, Intro 722, which, as my colleague mentioned in the testimony, we absolutely support the intent of Intro 722 uh, operationally. There's some, we do have some concerns, and we would very much welcome the opportunity to work more closely with the council. Just to elaborate a little bit on that, um, our regulatory agreements tend to be very complicated and layered. Uh, you might have a mortgage period that goes for 30 or 40 years, you have a low-income housing tax credit period that runs for another, you have a project-based rental subsidy contract that has yet another period on it, maybe there's a ground lease, maybe there's some permanently affordable units. So to say the expiration date is X is actually a particularly, is quite challenging, and that's on a new construction project. When you then start layering it on preservation where you have some existing requirements and then you're adding on top of that new requirements, um, it is not a straightforward thing to do. So I think, again, operationally, we, we, or we support the intention of the bill, but I think actually translating it into operational reality is very challenging. Um, I also think there's some concerns for tenants as well when we talk about reporting, um, because as written right now, the bill would require that we report each of those various milestones, even if actually the layered combination of them means that there is no risk for the tenant at that particular point in time. So I think there's some risk that we actually cause significant anxiety for somebody who's living in a building that appears to have an expiration date coming up if they don't then understand that there is something else underlying it that, that puts much longer affordability period on top of that. Um, but as I say, we would very much welcome the opportunity to work with the council uh, on that moving forward. Um, Oh, okay. I'll let you add. Um, on the note of the concentration of developments uh, spatially, um, we do report our housing data production, um, and what you, you see is you, you see a lot of affordable housing across the city. Um, but what you also see is there, um, and what we expect this to be surfaced through the where we live process, is there are some barriers to affordable housing development um, there, and these will be what we kind of draw out through the process and identify as contributing factors they'll be referred to. Um, I want to note that a majority of our work is preservation. Um, so one of the things that, for example, the 2015 update, while it helped, it also, um, uh, it also didn't talk too much or give specific very specific guidance on displacement um, and how that is a fair housing issue. And we really want to work together to clarify to the, to the federal government that that is an issue for high cost cities and we've been in contact with other ones. So on the context, in the context of, you know, is are our housing investments spatially uh, distributed or are or evenly distributed or are they geographic specific, you will see pre preservation investments in areas where there were affordable housing investments 20, 30 years ago because, you know, a, a lot of HPD's work was about building up those communities. Um, so that is kind of the, when you see that as well, when you see those clusters, you also have to keep in mind that we're not, we're looking to keep people in those neighborhoods because as those neighborhoods grow, it's an opportunity for integration and a moment as well. If I could just chime in as well, there's a map on our website of all of our Housing New York starts, so the, that is a great way to see the spatial distribution. Thank you, and Mr. Chair, if I can just close by saying, you know, obviously in a time uh, where someone like Dr. Ben Carson, who I always say is not just in the sunken place, he helped develop it, uh, and he's trying to mm. take away even the need to have to have a uh, fair housing plan is really up to uh, uh, think about fair housing and segregation and desegregation. Um, it's up to us to really uh, move the ball 
and I would like to at some point have the committee follow up on this. I understand what you're saying about preservation. I was specifically asking about the units being built, as you know, uh, particularly with MIH, which I hope this body reviews, uh, but I am happy that the administration is now trying to make up for, I think, time lost, but in some of those units that are being built, they are all clustered and not helping desegregate the city. So I'm hoping we can follow up with some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We are on our second round of questions, uh, starting with Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this builds on the answer that you, that you gave Council Member Williams, and I think goes to some of the same questions. One of the challenges we're going to face in the where we live process, in the AFFH process, is that the traditional HUD enforcement tools around fair housing were, in, from my point of view, sort of developed in a different time when what we were facing was abandonment and there was a concern, understandable and, and important to pay attention to, that the investment of certain kinds of federal resources would further segregation through affordable housing investments. And look, let's call it what it is. We did some of that in New York City and not for bad reasons. Neighborhoods were abandoned. We wanted to bring them back. There wasn't a housing market. We invested to build affordable housing in those neighborhoods. It was a strategy I'm proud to have taken part in, and it augmented segregation. Like that, that is a consequence of that strategy that we took for good reasons and not for bad ones. But now we're in this quite different situation where displacement is a real fear and anxiety, as you mentioned, where the challenge of getting more affordable housing units in high-cost neighborhoods is extremely challenging. So we need a new set of tools because and there are, you know, so some of the old tools, it seems to me, are, are, are not the right ones. So, um, uh, you know, HUD's trying to end our community preference program doesn't help us keep people in neighborhoods and generate new affordable housing. Small area FMRs we all had to fight because we didn't want it to be impossible for people in the Bronx to be able to use their Section 8 vouchers. So yes, we'd like to be able to pay more in high cost neighborhoods, but not if that means you can only pay less in, uh, and people in the, in who had their vouchers in the Bronx can't find a place at all. And focusing on this, the low income housing tax credit portfolio and saying you can't use that in neighborhoods where you want to build the most deeply affordable units, as Councilmember Williams talked about. Like, those are the traditional HUD enforcement strategies. And we need new tools if we're going to enable people to stay in their neighborhoods as their neighborhoods grow and change so that they can benefit from that. And, and even stronger new tools to find ways to make inclusionary work at scale in high cost neighborhoods. So I just wonder, like, we can't just do a planning process that kind of takes existing fair housing tools. We've got to think about and look at those. But I guess I'm just wondering what thought you've given to, do you agree with me that there's some mismatch? And if so, um, even at the beginning of the process, what can we do to make sure the process we come out with achieves the goals of fair housing and integration in a very different New York City? Yeah. Um, we do agree with you. Um, I think uh, we absolutely see and understand how some of the existing tools have um, had some unintended consequences, even though we all are proud of the housing work that we've done in the city, especially relative to um, nationally when you look at um, how much affordable housing municipalities have been able to build. Um, New York's been able to do quite a bit. Um, I think for us, um, it's really in this process looking about um, how we're going to be able to enable this balanced approach of doing both place-based investments that go beyond housing, as you note in your report, and as we um, are going to be going through with this process, um, kind of enabling fair housing and, and affirmatively furthering it goes well beyond enforcement tools and well beyond housing tools. Um, so we will be engaging um, our sister agencies and already have been working with them in this planning process uh, to make sure that um, broader city and investments are all working together to uh, do more to further fair housing. Um, and, and we're not looking at this just about housing tools and strategies, um, but working closely with DOE on their diversity task force, um, with the uh, Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Environmental Justice Task Force, um, with the De Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on some of the racial equity work that they're doing. Um, so this is going to require um, multiple agencies and multiple tools to be reevaluated re and looked at together. And we, so we do agree with you. And just to chime in on a couple of the strategies that we do have now, I don't want to presuppose what will come out of the planning process, but uh, on the voluntary inclusionary front, which we, we spent a lot of time here talking about at MIH, but, but voluntary inclusionary is really important as well. 
Um, in 2017, the 18 tallest buildings that completed construction, so 18 buildings had um, close to 1,300 units of affordable housing in them, right? And those are really by definition in the highest market neighborhoods. So, you know, that is a piece of the puzzle. It is a piece of uh, a tool that we have to work with and we continue to look at VIH to make sure that it is effective. Um, on kind of the opposite end of the housing spectrum, I'm really thrilled about the Neighborhood Pillars program that we are launching right now. This is designed to bring the existing rent stabilized but not kind of officially affordable housing stock into un under regulatory agreement. We issued an RFQ last week for preservation purchasers, for uh, nonprofits and other mission-based developers to participate in that program. We'll be issuing a term sheet soon. And I think it's a really exciting anti-displacement strategy. So we do continue to look at our tools. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Thank you so much. Uh, so you said, just to go back, neighborhood pillars in the RFQ, so we'll be receiving more information on that program in the coming week? Sure, we're absolutely happy to talk to you about that. The RFQ went out, um, RFP. I think, Thursday, something like that, and we're happy to talk to you about that. But the idea is that we are going to help nonprofits with the pre-development funding, um, down payment assistance, technical assistance, so that they can go out and compete in the mar private sector to acquire these buildings and bring them into the officially affordable housing stock. That's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resources, and I know you have a great team. I see Sarah Mallory and Leah Reese. And they're excellent. Um, we agree. Yes, they are. <laughs> they're on the record. So um, I wanted to uh, in your I want to point to stuff that you mentioned directly in your testimony. So you said you are identifying ways to make common data points more standardized, and you said you're working to secure funding to integrate the department's respective data systems. So what is what is that process like? What is the timeline? Because I know that your hesitation and fulfilling introduction, uh, intro 722, is, to quote, a difficult task. Um, so what are you doing to get to as close as what that intro would require? Thank you. Um, it is a difficult task and because of the complexity of the information and also just the scale of the, um, the, scale of the work. Um, as we mentioned in testimony, we did start this. Um, and I'd be remiss not to point out as well, there have been some um, times over the last 10 years that I know of that where this has been attempted. Um, the private market and Furman Center, uh, because I was a research assistant there at the time, uh, was working with HUD and HPD and HCR um, through a MacArthur grant to, to try to document this information. Um, and despite a lot of resources there and despite a private grant, the um, there when it came to the let's look at every regulatory agreement and document the information, it became a, uh, such a difficult task that it, it, it was somewhat limited. It limited the scope of their ability to to get that information out. So what we really want to be doing here is not to do a patch. We want to be um, understanding how all of our data systems work together, and we have a really fantastic data team that is that is thinking this through, building on the work that our asset management group has started. Because for us, it's not about saying, OK, let's just get through the next year and get all that information uh, documented and out. It's about actually building on this so the next generation can also use this. Um, we here at the table are kind of standing on shoulders. And the people that did the work in the 80s and 90s were working really hard to put things in the regulatory agreement that you know, are, are kind of hooks and tools today. So as Commissioner Park pointed out, you know, that in some sense requires people to come back. But it also is, for us, you know, requires a, a digitization of information from the 80s and 90s and 2000s, um, which is just a, a manual task that requires data entry and requires it um, the process to be solved going forward. So for us, it's about looking at how all of our data systems we use, you know, I like to think of it on levels, you know, we use um, household level information or tenant information, which includes multiple family members, uh, unit information, which includes things like rent and bedroom size and square footage, 
um, building information, like number of stories, um, the, and then the development information. Sometimes there are multiple buildings in a development. And then on top of that, you have tax lots. And sometimes there are multiple developments on tax lots. Um, and so it's all, it's all to say, like, we absolutely support that this information makes us more competitive. It makes us more, find more preservation opportunities. It's a matter of doing this right uh, and taking the time in order to do so. So a long-winded way of answering your question to say, you know, we're in the midst of developing what exactly that plan looks like right now. Um, it will require skilled labor. It will require people that know how to, you know, read these regulatory agreements and look for specific information and deeds and zoning requirements and things like that. So we're in the midst of that. We'll, you know, report back when we have exact a more clarified plan about and what re what resources exactly are required. So, and and my second question is in terms of the significant resources that you mentioned, obviously just keep us in mind because we want you to be able to do your job that enables us to be better to our constituents. Um, you mentioned it is hard to track and it would be difficult to almost create this transparent system because you have real fears of speculation. And, and I totally understand that because we're from, you know, well, Council Member Chin and I are from areas of Manhattan that are incredibly desirable and have been for decades. Um, and so in terms of tracking and not really being able to give us a full number, do you have any idea in terms of how many have expired? So for example, a breakdown of units that have been lost due to expiring subsidies. And I know that everything is different and you gave us a very good breakdown of bullet points as to how nuanced the property can be. But do you know how many we have lost just straight out of the affordable housing market? And I, I guess that would also include Michelama units in terms of how they privatize and we, we've lost those. Uh, we can, I don't have the Mitchell Lama number with me right now. We can certainly get back to you on that. Um, the short answer is because of the way that regulatory agreements have been tracked or not tracked in the past, I can't give you a straight answer on that. But I do want to point again to our, our track record on preservation. Within the 59,000 units that we have preserved under Housing New York, uh, two-thirds of those had ex previous regulatory agreements. We do a lot of outreach. We really structure the deal so that they do come back. Um, we are in, do work in a public-private partnership. At the end of the day, um, we have to make it uh, appealing for people to come back in, either that the incentives of not doing, the consequences of not doing so are so negative and we do set up sort of the stick approach or that there is positive approach to positive reasons for doing it. We set that up as well. Um, but it is fundamentally a market-driven system and we, we can't get to 100%. Well, you know, just um, in my district, there are many HDFCs, and we're also going through a regulatory agreement uh, battle. And I know those would count towards the administration's preservation goals, so I'm looking forward to working with you on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So before we go to uh, Council Member Chen, I just had um, <clears throat> a question. Uh, so in my district, um, we've lost on, on, on the lines of preservation, we've lost some units based on subsidies expiring. Um, and I've been caught kind of going in after the it's already expired to try to renegotiate with the landlord, which is laughable, obviously, at this point. Um, can you provide the council a breakdown on the amount of units that have been lost to expiring subsidies in the three categories that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, extremely low income, low income, and uh, moderate income? Units. I know that's a lot, but it, it's important that we begin to look at that. Like I told you, I'm, I'm from experience. I'm speaking, where as an advocate for my community, I tried to go in uh, two years after some, something had sunset. Um, Understood. Um, unfortunately, given the systems that we have in place right now, I cannot give you exactly that answer. Um, we have a very strong preservation track record. We know we have gotten to a very large number, been able to preserve a very large number of units. We remain committed to that and we remain committed to structuring our deals such that preservation um, happens as frequently as possible, but I can't give you the breakdown that you're asking. So, uh, uh, so that, that concerns me. I, I really need to know that a methodology is in place to catch these before 
they're sunsetting. And if, and if it's not happening now, what can we do as a council to support an effort to make sure that that particular incidents doesn't, doesn't occur again. So let me talk a little bit about the tools that we have to make, to create strong incentives for buildings to come back in, because we absolutely start thinking about preservation from day one before we ever even close a deal. Um, when we do, when we put a regulatory agreement on a project, that regulatory agreement is a recorded document, um, meaning that whenever there's a financial transaction, a sale, a refinance, anything like that, that the um, owner, the, the regulatory agreement comes up in the title search and the owner and the financial institution have to deal with HPD. We structure all of our agreements with uh, consent to transfer, consent to refinance. Um, and even if the owner is looking to do something nefarious, the financial institution knows that they need to come deal with us because their collateral is impacted if they don't do that. Um, so that is something that we do, again, from day one. We also structure most of our loans, virtually all of our loans, as <coughs> balloon mortgages, meaning that the uh, rather than amortize over the life of the mortgage, that they all accrue and come due payable at the end. So at the end of a regulatory period, at the end of the mortgage period, uh, that owner o typically owes something like close to twice what they borrowed. The reason we do that is that that significant financial liability becomes a strong hook to come back in and deal with HPD. Um, there's, uh, those are sort of two very key structural aspects of our deals that we put in place. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that property tax exemptions expire. That's actually a useful preservation tool because uh, that is a very uh, immediate financial reality that will very often bring owners back into dealing with HPD. So we structure projects such that there is there are both uh, carrots and sticks for um, reasons to come and deal with us, reasons that owners should want to, but also conse financial consequences for not doing that. But at the end of the day, it is fundamentally a voluntary system, and if, if somebody opts not to do that, um, the co-ops were mentioned earlier, and there are certainly situations where um, markets have changed such that uh, homeowners decide that they want to take advantage of the wealth building aspect of it as opposed to the ongoing affordability. Um, that is that is a system that we live in, and, and we cannot preserve 100%. So I, I really appreciate that answer, but it's actually the answer to another question. What, I, what I'm trying to get to is a mechanism in place that alerts uh, us, and I'm going to say us because I'm counting that, you know, we, we're in this together, um, that alerts prior to. What you've mentioned are systems in place when you're at the end of the sunset. So for me, we do a tax lien sale abatement in my district and we have a 30, 60, 90 day uh, way of addressing people who may be on the list. I I'd like to see prior to the sunset uh, a negotiation process with developers and or landlords right. uh, and incentivizing you know, five years out, three years out, two years out. Because uh, what I'm finding is once you get to the end, They've already made all the necessary calculations, whether it's a, whether there's a financial loss, whether there's a penalty in taxes, uh, and built that into the sale or transfer of that property. I, I'd like to have a mechanism in place that alerts us, right. you know, five years, three years, two years prior to its sunsetting so we could begin a process of negotiation for preservation as opposed to waiting to the end. If, if you, I'm, I've seen this a thousand times already. If you, wait, if you wait till the end, they've already done the necessary calculations and have an escape a methodology that, that puts at risk those affordable units. We, we should have that process, uh, you know, uh, th at least three times prior to where we're negotiating with landlords and or developers. Understood. Um, we do it quite a bit now on a fairly retail level, and we'd be certainly happy to collaborate with you on the on buildings that are in your district in that uh, building by building system. Uh, as we've talked about, we definitely support the intent of the intro to do something on a more comprehensive basis, I think, and we need to work through the operational concerns. Um, the other thing that I want to add is that I think the, the multi-layered and non-contiguous uh, regulatory periods that we've talked about a bit, um, while cumbersome and sometimes challenging to work with, also have an advantage because they do provide that multi, that, that, uh, those trigger points throughout the lifespan of a project. So for example, year 15 is a critical point in time um, for a low-income housing tax credit project because the tax credit investor is gonna exit. 
Um, that is a moment where we always engage with that property, but the affordability actually goes through year 30, right? So we have that interim system built in. I know we have done some low-income housing tax credit preservation projects in your district, and um, that's something that's very important to us. So, um, you know, there are tools that we have now. They are not as comprehensive as they potentially could be, but we're happy to work with you on the buildings that we flag through the uh, more retail process. So I'm looking forward to working with you on, on a process okay. uh, uh, that helps preserve affordability in any way that we possibly can. And my questions are not an indictment of what you're doing now, but just uh, an effort for us to collaborate on a stronger way to hold this affordability, uh, not in perpetuity, but when we can stretch it out, obviously it's important to do that. Agreed that it's critical. Thank you. Council Member Chen. Thank you. Um, First of all, I do want to thank H3D for working with me, and we did quite a large number of uh, preservation, especially in a couple of the project-based Section 8, um, and one even exited the program, we were able to get back half the building. Um, but I wanted to really look at to see if HPD could work with us on a more proactive approach with private uh, homeowners, private landlords, because a lot of the program uh, in terms of you know, providing the subsidy and, and regulatory agreement has been used with buildings that are run by nonprofits. Um, but right now, what we're exploring um, in certain part of my district, like in Chinatown, we're looking at a possibility of doing a community land trust. Because uh, the private property owner are like desperate in a way because they're complaining about the high property tax and they want some relief. And so we see as an opportunity to see if we can offer uh, some property tax relief in exchange for um, permanent or um, affordable unit for a certain period of time. Uh, so that's something that I think it will be good for us to sort of explore with private property owner because some of the property owners, they don't want to sell. But they tell me, like, every day they're getting calls, you know, from realtor wanting to buy their building. And, but they don't want to sell. But then the property tax keeps going up, and they cannot afford to maintain their building. Uh, and then oftentimes, um, another problem that happens is that the, the small businesses that rent the storefront space oftentimes ends up with picking up uh, the property tax uh, increase. Um, and that makes, you know, it's very hard for small business to be able to stay. So we're looking at um, possibility of some relief, whether it's property tax exemption or property tax deferral, if uh, an owner um, is willing to come in and say, you know, in exchange for affordability unit. And we also have properties in our community where it's owned by uh, an organization, a family association. They're never going to sell the building, but their property tax keeps going up, and they want some tax relief. So we see that as an opportunity to maybe do some kind of a community land trust, kind of bring them all together, um, or you know, work with them individually. Right. We absolutely agree with you. We do um, property tax benefits in exchange for affordability on a regular basis. Uh, we typically use the Article 11 tax exemption for that, so they all come through this, the council, and we thank you very much for your support on those. There are some you know, legal requirements for complying with Article 11, but there's a fair amount of flexibility there, so we'd be more than happy to work with you on the buildings that you've identified. I think that's, that would be good because I think oftentimes with Article 11, is that you could use that also for private property owner? There needs to be an HDFC in the structure, but yes, we are able to make that work. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chairman. Certainly, affordable housing, housing uh, in general, is probably the city's most difficult challenge um, in modern times to accommodate. I'm wondering, uh, in discussing the affordability, the new construction as well as the preservation of the 59,000 units. Why are we doing more to take advantage of the vacant lots New York City has? Why aren't we developing those properties that are owned by New York City? Um, I'd like to note that we um, actually have a very robust pipeline of 
uh, city-owned sites that we are working to develop. Um, we've been developed, we've already put out requests for proposals for uh, close to 60 projects on publicly owned sites, um, which is a significant increase from past administrations. Uh, we also developed uh, a new program at the beginning of the administration to try to develop um, really small, difficult devel to develop sites. We call that the new infill home um, ownership program and the new construction program, which is designed to, uh, to develop some of those smaller sites that traditionally have been harder to develop. Um, so there aren't a lot of um, large, good to develop sites left in our inventory. There are some very small sites that are um, challenging to, de uh, to develop that are left in our inventory. Uh, we also partner with other agencies to look at things that are in their portfolio um, and, and build those into our pipeline as well. Um, uh, finally, I'll note that the pace at which we're able to develop um, public sites uh, also depends on the availability of financing. And our um, housing plan depends on both public and private sites. Um, and we really look to leverage private resources and private land as well to be um, meeting our housing goals. So uh, we have a, a very robust uh, pipeline of public sites. We plan to continue that. Um, we also, I should note, some of the public sites that are in our inventory are in um, resiliency areas that we're still evaluating whether it's possible to build there or whether it's just too risky or too vulnerable environmentally to do so. Um, so for the most part, we've been um, either uh, developing or in the, are in the process of developing the sites that are, are in our pipeline. Well, I applaud you for uh, having 60 projects in the pipeline, but affordable housing is a real crisis. Mm -hmm. And years later, if we're still evaluating what can be done with, va with property that has been vacant for decades, I think we're not doing all that we can do. While we discuss preservation of affordable housing, um, what are your thoughts on programs that assure us housing remains affordable, such as SCREE and DRE? Sure, I think those are really critical pieces of the housing toolbox. I think they, uh, and they're particularly useful for reaching households who may live in buildings that are not under an HPD or other formal regulatory agreement, but uh, they help the tenants obviously remain in their homes and remain protected. Um, you know, I think the, the nature of scree and DRE, they're critically important, but when they, they lock in the rent burden that a tenant has at the point of time that they sign up. So it is very useful for some households and somewhat less useful for other households. So I, I think I'm very glad we have them in the toolbox, but I think they are a piece of the answer and not the answer in the, in the whole, as a whole. Right, but a useful program to preserving these affordable housing for so many New Yorkers. Without a doubt. Would you be supportive of expanding those programs? So. Um, we're supportive of finding all tools that we can use to keep people in their homes and keep, it, keep people in their homes or give them the choice to stay in their homes um, without having to face um, rapid rent increases. Um, Scree and DRE operate within the uh, rent stabilized stock. And we've talked a little bit about rent stabilization, but mostly been focusing on the HPD regulatory agreement part. Um, SCREE and DRE do come at a cost to the city. Um, they, uh, the city expends tax revenue or ex tax expenditure in order to subsidize these special populations uh, and give them the choice It's senior citizens and people with disabilities. So Screen and Dre are targeted programs to these special populations, uh, which also does touch on the fair housing conversation we've been having, which is around um, looking at people with protected class status and, and doing uh, more to help them stay in their homes. Uh, so yeah, we support all the tools, um, but you know we have to understand that they also operate within larger systems, like the rent stabilization system, which keeps New York, helps keep New York City diverse. But I agree with you, doing all that we can is pertinent here. Um, and the expansion that I'm referring to, not only protecting uh, New Yorkers, our most vulnerable, our seniors and those that are disabled, but an expansion through the TREE program using the same criteria. Families earning under $50,000 a year, making sure that they will not be subject to future rent increases 
is a way to make certain our affordable housing stock remains affordable to those families and the tax burden, as you put it, on the city would be at a minimum compared to the investment that we're, we're making on preserving. These are units that already exist. These programs would further help and assist those families, the most vulnerable that we have, and that is families that earn uh, less than $50,000 a year. So I would hope that we can talk a little bit more about this and understand the importance of expanding such programs. I believe we have a meeting scheduled with you on April 23rd um, to discuss it. And you know, I think when we testified here last month on the uh, rent regulation renewal, um, it, you know, it, this 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 particular proposal had come up, and and so we're we're following up to discuss. Um, just to reiterate that, you know, rent regulation as a whole is obviously critical to our entire city's uh, diversity, um, and. We view it as giving the, the choice for people to stay in their neighborhood. Um, and there's not really a substitute for that. Um, so, you know, we look forward to the conversation. We expect a lot of proposals to be um, discussed around rent regulation, um, but it's important that we're balancing the, the fiscal concerns with the policy goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Chonai. Um, on behalf of uh, City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, who's unable to be here right now, there are a couple of questions that were germane to him, and I'm going to ask those on his behalf. Uh, so how does the city define an affordable housing unit that was created and an affordable housing unit that was preserved in the Housing New York plan? Sure. So uh, preserved means very bluntly that the building is and the unit already exists, and we are extending the affordability um, or adding affordability. In some cases, there, there are no requirements at all. Um, it can be, preservation unit can be anything from, uh, as we talked about, putting a tax exemption on in exchange for affordability all the way through gut rehab. So it doesn't necessarily involve construction, but it does involve adding affordability. Um, that is, and, and majority involve construction, but certainly not all. Um, new construction is is exactly that. It is taking build, creating a building that didn't previously exist before. And uh, is this method consistent with previous housing plans that were released by other mayoral administration? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the housing plan, new, the housing New York plan, will now run to 2026 instead of 2024. That means that the housing plan will end four years after Mayor De Blasio leaves office. What's the reasoning to extend the period of the housing plan? Uh, it is, producing the affordable housing is, is, there's a lot to be said for the momentum behind it. Um, the, we are a big industry. We are, we are the people at HPD and at HDC, but we are also the developers, for-profit, non-profit. We are the uh, lenders, the tax credit investors, and creating that momentum and investing the money in the budget. The money is in the budget and that, um, it is, once the machine is moving, it is harder to slow it down. So by, by setting the standard, by putting out that we will do 25,000 units of affordable housing every year and ramping that machine up to produce that, um, it, it has a powerful momentum behind it. So, so obviously for some of us that creates a little bit of a concern because pushing things out into the years that an, a current, another administration is due to take over, um, we're not certain that, that they'll be consistent with the, the plans of the former administration. So how does, how does the administration plan to ensure that the goals of Housing New York will continue under a future administration? Well, I think, first of all, as I mentioned, putting money in the budget, this is, I'm, I'm borrowing a line from the mayor here, but it is much harder to take money back once it's been put into the budget, and certainly for something that is as critical in need as affordable housing and that has as much support behind it. So I think simply budgeting and planning for it is in, in and of itself a powerful statement. Um, we, at the end of the day, there is opportunity to change goals, that that happens. Sometimes goals change even within an administration. If, for example, there's a major change in the economy, we would expect the plan to react to that. But I think 
Um, the momentum really does matter. Uh, I will also say that we aren't backloading this. This is a, a plan. The expansion, the new programs, everything else starts immediately. So we are growing Housing New York starting from the day that it was announced in the fall. So some of my colleagues believe that in a very strong housing market that we should be demanding more from development in terms of affordability, and we can get that because the market is so strong. What's the difference between being very aggressive uh, in a strong market uh, in terms of affordable units and demanding that and in a weaker market and how are we differentiating between the two markets for affordable housing? Sure. So I think we are absolutely drawing on market-driven strategies right now. Uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, voluntary inclusionary housing, uh, 421A, these are all places where we are able to get affordable housing without putting in direct capital subsidy. Um, because we do have a strong market, because there is value in being able to go higher or to be able to get some temporary tax relief from your taxes. So we are doing that right now. It's an important piece. Um, we are also able to, I think, get deeper affordability right now in a relatively strong market because we can put um, some units in buildings that have some, even 100% affordable buildings, we can have some moderate or middle income units that then cross subsidize the operation of really deeply affordable units. So these are all strategies that we're using right now in a relatively strong market. Um, when the market is, is weaker, there is both, there are challenges and opportunities. Um, I actually was at HPD in 2008, 2009. It was a very, very different kind of time. Um, we were focused a lot more on preservation. We were focused on purchasing uh, notes of distressed properties. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly exciting about neighborhood pillars w that I mentioned earlier, uh, that we are structuring it today with an eye to preserving buildings that could very easily um, be um, targets of speculators where you could see rents go up. We think we're targeting them today because they have the potential to have significantly increased rents, but the uh, programmatic infrastructure that we are creating that is providing down payment assistance and technical assistance to nonprofits to acquire these buildings, I think could also work very well in a downturn if you, you, what you had is instead of properties at risk of speculators, properties at risk of disinvestment. So the last question on behalf of the speaker, I believe you may have answered it, but I think I asked the question more broadly and uh, he's way more concise. Uh, can you walk us through the steps that need to occur before the expiration of a regulatory agreement at a development? Sure. So if a, um, if a building is coming, uh, if one of the various regulatory pieces of the, the financing package or the regulatory agreement in a building is expiring, and I say one of because there are all of these multiple overlapping non-contiguous, um, we will do outreach, owners will come to us. Um, you know, there, there's very often, we work very closely with our community nonprofit partners. They will often identify a building. We flag a building as having this particular date in, in time, right? So for a low income housing tax credit project, for example, that is coming up to year 15, um, we will reach out to them. We will facilitate the uh, exit of the of the investor, and so there's a legal repositioning that happens then. We will also encourage the owner to do a physical needs assessment to figure out whether or not there actually is work required. We will take a look at whether or not the building has sufficient reserves to do that work. Um, wait, wait, before you finish answering the question, so you, you said that you'll encourage, there's no mandate though to do that assessment. You can, o you can only encourage. At the end of the day, we are working in a public-private partnership market-driven system. Um, at the point of year 15 where we still have a lot of hooks for the property, um, encourage, the line between encourage and require is a fairly thin one, um, so we are going to get the physical needs assessment done on that property, um, but at the end of the day it is the owner of the property who's hiring the contractor to do the physical needs assessment. They're hiring somebody off of an HPD pre-qualified list, but they are the ones actually doing that. Um, based on 
an assessment of the physical condition and the financial condition of the building, we may steer it in a variety of different routes. If the building is actually physically distressed, we're gonna try and get it into an HPD loan program where we are investing new capital dollars into the physical condition of the building. Um, I do wanna stress that you know, physical distress may or may not be a reflection of the quality of the management. Um, if the building had been, uh, had 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 a lighter rehab scope 15 years ago, right? If it was a city-owned building that had had a fairly light rehab scope 15 years ago, it may need more work now than if it was a new construction building that that uh, that was coming to year 15, right? So you see a variety of physical needs. Um, if it so so if the, there's real need there, we will get it into a rehab program. If there isn't significant physical need, we will reposition the tax credit investor, restructure it, we will uh, add, typically look to add some affordability there by extending the tax benefits, by um, you know providing other kinds of financial incentives so that we are pushing out the end of that, that um, regulatory agreement. As I say, it is a fairly retail process where we are going building by building and dealing with the individual projects, physical and financial circumstances, but we have a very strong track record of success. Um, I, I've said it one uh, several times, but I will say it again, that we've done 40,000 units within Housing New York that are preservation of previously existing regulatory agreements. Thank you. If there are no more questions from my colleagues, uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. We're going to call the next panel. Thank you to my colleagues who are able to stay as well. Uh, Juan Sweeney, Tahika Fredericks, Harry Dorenzo, and Gregory Jost. Uh, so I just ask um, that you indulge me in the idea that chivalry still exists and we let the testimonies begin by the ladies first. Press the button now, sir. Uh, they, have, they actually, they're, they're, our, they're, actually, they're our bosses and um, they decided on the order last night at a meeting, so. Okay, as long as you, if, you, if you worked that out already. <laughs> Uh, but if you can just, for the record, identify yourself before giving your testimony. Uh, my name is Tahisha Fredericks, and I'm a board member and resident leader in the Bronx. Harry DiRienzo, President and CEO of Banana Kelly Community Improvement Association. Wanda Swinney, um, board member and council leader of Banana Kelly. Hi, I'm Gregory Jost, and I'm the director of organizing at Banana Kelly. Uh, and I'm going to start us off, and thank you very much for, for having us here, uh, esteemed members of the New York City Council on the Committee on Housing and Buildings. And uh, Banana Kelly Community Improvement Association is a 40-year-old uh, community-based organization working on um, community-controlled neighborhood solutions and improvement in the South Bronx. And uh, we're all here today just to, to speak about Intro 607 which we, we appreciate the, the, the spirit of, and we just have some concern about some of the actual specific language in. Um, so in addition to working my work at Banana Kelly, I'm also a community researcher and scholar who works on um, the history of redlining and how that's defined the Bronx and many other cities around the country, and uh, thinking about how it impacts segregation and, and how we understand these as issues. Uh, and so, you know, you may be very familiar with this, but when the, when the federal government first got intensely involved in the housing market during the New Deal, surveyors assigned levels of risk to neighborhoods based primarily on the race and ethnicity of the people who lived there, using terms such as 
quote unquote, detrimental influences Negro and Puerto Rican infiltration. Redlining transformed the explicitly racist language of the Jim Crow era into relentless and pervasive structural racism, collapsing race in place in a way that would create the hypersegregated neighborhoods that we are still dealing with today. Yet, as historian Craig Stephen Wilder writes about, um, in, about segregated Brooklyn, quote, that isolation was only the lubricant for oppression. Racial concentration set the foundation for broader social, uh, um, social domination, men, um, excuse me. Racial concentration set the foundation for a broader social agenda that put the black population at the mercy of their white co-citizens. Mr. Joss, what was that author again? Craig Stephen Wilder. He's, uh, it, the book is called uh, A Covenant with Color, Race and Social Power in Brooklyn. He's, uh, he also wrote a book that came out last year on uh, Ebony and Ivy about the history of um, the Ivy League colleges and how slavery built them. I'm sorry, I see that it's footnoted here in your notes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Do little footnotes. Um, so this white domination manifested not only in unequal policing and education, but also through serial displacement on unprecedented levels, as seen in programs such as slum clearance and urban renewal in the 50s and 60s, followed by benign neglect and planned shrinkage during the 70s and 80s. And it was against this backdrop of displacement, exploitation, and devastation that historically redlined people, primarily black and Puerto Rican, came together to save their buildings, blocks, and neighborhoods through community control, collective ownership, and sweat equity. Residents on Kelly Street in the Bronx and in neighborhoods just like that all across the city and country have been battling overwhelming forces of, for these types of forces for decades, building community, restoring social fabric, and fighting both disinvestment and displacement. Today, in a climate of speculation and gentrification across the city, we fear that the vagueness of the language in Intro 607 specifically requiring that any affordable housing plan developed by the city includes certain types of actions that, quote, address significant disparities in housing needs and in access to opportunity, replacing segregated living patterns with truly integrated and balanced living patterns, transforming racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity. While we understand this language comes from HUD, we believe that left as is, this bill can readily be interpreted to allow or even encourage integration through gentrification and assumes that communities of color will only become places of opportunity by a significant increase in the presence of white people. We reject this premise as well as the understanding of segregation as the root cause of the disparities you are seeking or we are all seeking to address. So I'm just gonna ask, um, while I respect and appreciate the preparedness of this panel, um, I wanna make sure everyone gets an opportunity to be heard, so if you can be as concise as you possibly can. And I promise to follow up because this is some great information uh, going forward. So great. thank you. Okay, my name is Harry DiRienzo again, and I also applaud the council members for taking um, this issue up. Uh, but I also urge the council members to take a step back and make sure that whatever is done legislatively is well thought out, inclusive, participatory, comprehensive, and not capable of doing more harm than good. Upon passage, the Fair Housing Act was a long overdue and critically important piece of civil rights legislation. And in most of America and close to the home in the suburban areas surrounding New York City, the legislation is as important today and as relevant today as in 1968. But in certain areas, particularly urban gentrifying areas of the city, the Fair Housing Act has worked and has the potential to continue to work against the very people it was supposed to help. The language in intro 607 focuses on neighborhoods like the South Bronx. That is appropriate, but it should take into account historical patterns of segregation and discrimination within historically redlined areas for the purpose of restorative justice. In other words, any community preferences should target public subsidies to those population groups historically deprived of mobility choice and opportunities for multi-generational wealth building. Furthermore, it should focus on the work that needs to happen in wealthier, whiter parts of the city and quite frankly, the region as well. Language uh, in any fair housing plan needs to acknowledge the specific and pervasive history of segregation and racism in this country and in this city and distinguish between the responsibility assigned to neighborhoods that have benefited from this history and those that have suffered. Historically redlined and disenfranchised people should, be, should not be threatened with displacement by actively seeking to integrate them on someone else's terms based upon the Fair Housing Act in the context of gentrification in formerly redlined neighborhoods. This hurts the very people that the act was designed to help and promotes intentionally or inadvertently in, uh, the disenfranchisement of our most vulnerable citizens, many of whom have, have worked for the last few decades rebuilding these very same neighborhoods, preserving and rebuilding. 
At Banana Kelly, we have fought for decades to gain community control over both process and resources. Any fair housing plan should include language that ensures that these values of inclusion, choice, particularly the choice of opportunity to retain home and community is maintained. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm next. <laughs> uh, again, my name is Tahisha Fredericks. I'm a board member of Banana Kelly, as well as a resident leader in the Bronx. I am originally from Brooklyn, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and my last stop before leaving Brooklyn was in Fort Greene, where I raised my children with my husband. And what concerns me about this particular leg legislation for Intro 607 is that the patterns are the same that I experienced in Brooklyn. Um, the instability is just something that I just cannot tolerate. What I am very most concerned about is that it leaves working families like my own seeking housing elsewhere once these patterns have started. Um, let me just find my place here. And uh, once we can't find uh, housing in our neighborhoods, we are left to look elsewhere. And if we can't find a place that's affordable, what's left for us is the shelters, which is where my family and I ended up. And nothing has changed. We continue to work and pay our taxes, and we sent our children to college, but we had to do it through while we were in the shelters. Um, after two years of being in the shelters, we actually found housing uh, with the help of Banana Kelly. And one year into our housing, I'm beginning to see the same patterns in the Bronx that I saw in Brooklyn. So this language in this particular uh, legislation is concerning me. So it just looks like there's just being a pretty hat put on gentrification. So it's kind of scary, so there's the red flags there. And uh, whether you want to believe it or not, it is impossible to create and build personal wealth without stability. We have to have roots. And it's in instability that produces and maintains the poverty. So it's not integrating the neighborhoods because once it's integrated, then people like myself, we can no longer afford our apartments and then we have to leave. So without those roots, we can't build our own wealth. So this is something that really needs to be considered. So there is no way that opportunity can be created by integrating our neighborhoods. So let's call this what it is. It's a pretty hat on gentrification. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Wanda Swinney, and I am a board member and resident council leader of Banana Kelly. Um, we have working, we have been working for decades to collectively own our own, own and control not only the buildings but the land also. We have fought, we have fought too long and hard for our neighborhoods to not be, to not be at the table when they're future is being decided. Please look to the work we do as, well, I would like you to invest in our work, actually, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Mutual Housing Association and Community Land Trust as a model for creating opportunity. Invest in us and the opportunities we can, and the opportunities we can create for ourselves. I'm try. I'm tired, I'm tired of what gets pushed upon us black communities. The people um, with racially um, demoralizing propagandas trying to subdue, subdue us. There are no more robotic mindsets here. Stop trying to mislead us to believe we become our own worst enemies and therefore we need, we need whites and therefore, we need whites to govern our lives, which is not true. Um, it's a psychological warfare designed to make black communities compli compliant with white um, demonized. <laughs> you have to excuse me. Um, with what, just whites just taking over our, our properties. And I have six children. I'm a, a mother of six children. I have 16 grandchildren. I have a great grand. And I mean, we deserve our own and just as well as anybody else. I've uh, um, experienced going to the shelter twice in my life, once 
by my daughter, by me going with my children, and then by my daughter going because she has to try to find a way of her own. We have a right to our own property and land also. Okay? Um, I'm not trying to get that far with it, but um, you all have good intentions. We all have good intentions with this bill, but it is clear. It isn't clear to us what you are trying to accomplish with it. We ask you to be both explicit and specific in what you want to do and make sure you figure out what figure out what um, figure out with us figure right out with us okay and I just wanted to say one more thing if it's okay um, I just want to say um, building so building on what we already do we ask that you would invest in us as we can as we continue to move forward with clarity for all so first of all I want to thank you all for your testimony um, a lot of uh, myself and my colleagues decisions and legislation is informed by having these robust conversations and I want to personally thank B Banana Kelly, Kelly for work that you do in minority communities to empower um, thank you for your testimony thank you. oh if I if I may please um, one more thing I'm, I'm only allowing this because you're originally from Besta <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> Um, if, if, if I may, uh, when the subject of certain affordability housing programs are allowed in our community, the pacification of just a few of these apartments that are in the new developing buildings in our neighborhoods is not enough. Um, we refer to these, these, uh, these crumbs as poor doors because we know the people who you know, get lucky enough to move into these buildings and they end up in the poor doors which is just uh, maybe a certain line of apartments that they would get, but they are denied certain services and amenities. So this is, you know, it's, we're not, you know, objecting, you know, new development or anything like that in our communities, but this cannot be considered fair just because it's affordable and they're throwing a few crumbs from their table. So it, it needs to be a little bit more than this. If, they, if they're gonna have these buildings in our communities, if you can't do 50-50, do 70, what is it, 70, 30, 60, 40, or whatever, but poor doors and columns and then denying us amenities, it's not gonna work. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, uh, Councilman Belanda, question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really appreciate you guys, this panel, and you're coming, and, and I, I guess I just wanna ask uh, the question, just so I'm sure I understand kind of what the, what to take away. You know, I think one challenge is it's easy for us in the context of thinking about integration to imagine, you know, Ruby Bridges, like one, you know, young African-American woman bravely, you know, integrating a white institution. New York City is two-thirds people of color, so the vision of an integrated New York City is not that. It's got to be something pretty different if we would be real about it, right? So I think this issue, like, the, the idea of integration in a city, the city we have today is not, like, you know, you talk about having, well, I guess it's, it's that simple. Like it would, it would, if it were integrated, it would be majority people of color in every neighborhood. Like that's what integration would look like. So um, I, I just, I wanna understand, like I could imagine, I wanna make sure I understand between two things. One of which is be careful, like pay attention in this legislation and make sure that if we're talking about affirmatively furthering fair housing, we're investing in people so they can stay in their neighborhoods, we're strengthening tenant protections, we're creating new opportunities for wealth building to make sure that folks can have a real stake. Um, and in that context, if we had that confidence, if we saw those policies, yes, we would want not to have such a segregated city. That would be option one. Option two would be like, leave us alone, we don't wanna have this process. Um, you know, we want to kind of be about our business and we're nervous that this is going to do more harm than good, so we'd rather not see it. And it's okay if you feel some mix of both, but I, I just want to make sure I understand so as we're trying to move forward here, we can do it mindful of, of what you think. We've been having meetings for years with our resident leaders, and our resident leaders are not against investment. They're not against, against the diversity of retail. They're not against having op economic opportunities that weren't there before. They are against these things coming into their neighborhoods at the expense of their being able to stay there. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line. And if we can't have development without displacement, 
then yes, you're right, it's number two. We don't want the development. Thank you. We're clear, thank you. Okay, thank yes, you. thank you. I'm gonna call uh, the next panel at this time, uh, beginning with Barika Williams, Adrian Wybean, I'm sorry, yes, Wybean, Marika Diaz, and Veronica Cook. And again, I just ask before you give testimony if you would just uh, state your name for the record. And we can begin wherever you'd like to begin. All right. I don't know, I always feel like, Barika, you should be the closer, but you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, um, Chair, and for, for the committee. Um, I, so I provided my written testimony, but also partly in, inspired by that wonderful panel by Banana Kelly. I sort of want to focus in on a couple of things. Um, and so first off, we applaud the council for taking on this issue and really moving forward a conversation around fair housing and likewise applaud the administration for making the decision to go ahead um, and invest and put resources and time and effort into working on fair housing despite what the federal government chose. Um, that being said, I just want to highlight a couple of things that both speak to the bills but also the broader issue. Um, one of which is the city's obligation around fair housing extends beyond the affordable housing plan and any affordable housing programs or policies. It covers the entire market, um, all housing actors, all industries, and all policies, right? And I think it's important in, in how we talk about this to not limit um, any of the legislation or the way that we think about fair housing strictly to a, an affordable housing plan. Um, second, I want to echo some of what the Banana Kelly group said and also push us to think about having a conversation of whether the goal of fair housing is evenness, right, uh, or, or whether the goal of fair housing is to support and, and ensure resources and investment in all communities, right? We, I, I don't know if we as New York are looking to have an even distribution of everyone all across the city if what that costs us is a Chinatown, is a little Caribbean, is a Bengali neighborhood, is a black African American like middle class community. These are core in what we understand as New York City and I think that's a tough thing to grapple with. I also think we've got to really struggle with um, many of the things that have come up in the rezonings and displacement and how these things are playing out in a disproportionate way for many groups that are prote in, in protected classes. 75% of, uh, of communities of color bel earn below 60% AMI. When we don't think about deep affordability, when we don't think about things like that, we are creating disproportionate impacts for communities of color right off the bat. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. And Hi, good afternoon. Thank uh, you. Sorry, <laughs> Brigitte is a tough act to follow. Uh, my name is Adrienne Weibgen. I'm an attorney at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center in the Equitable Neighborhoods Practice. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, Adrienne, can you pronounce your last name for me again? I have a feeling that I'm gonna be calling it often. It's, it's pronounced Weibgen, or if you wanna be fancy, Weibgen. It's uh, German. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to testify and uh, for introducing this important legislation to address the issues that the Fair Housing Act raises. Um, this process in New York is going to require us facing a lot of ugly truths because too many communities, as you know, have weathered and continue to weather significant disparities caused both by private action and by public forms of dis discrimination and investment um, and, and many other uh, ways that communities were created, uh, both good and bad. So um, as James Baldwin teaches us, nothing can be changed until it's faced and CDP and its partners are grateful that both the council and the de Blasio administration are facing these difficult issues despite um, the federal government's disinterest in doing so. Um, that being said, uh, we're a little concerned that the scope of the bills is, is too narrow to address what the Fair Housing Act requires, both, as Barika said, because the housing issues alone uh, require a wide array of strategies and because the Fair Housing Act looks not only at housing, but also, um, as HPD testified, many other areas that relate to neighborhood inequality and segregation, including, but not limited to, 
um, poverty in these areas, um, investment in schools, uh, transportation, and job access. So um, these are all things that CDP and its partners are very excited to address as part of the Where We Live NYC process. And uh, we hope that after that process concludes, it will be possible for the council to introduce legislation that fully addresses the array of strategies that that process will have produced. Um, it's one that we hope that many of the communities that are most impacted by fair housing issues will have a real opportunity to participate in, and there will be a lot of um, need to address the indicators. So I'm gonna run over my time just a little bit to uh, shout out Banana Kelly for raising the particularly difficult issue that um, gentrification causes within the fair housing context, uh, which is one that New Orleans and other cities that have already undertaken their affirmatively fair housing assessments um, have addressed. Gentrification doesn't create a stable form of integration or benefit the people um, that the, whose needs the Fair Housing Act uh, was designed to address. Um, that is why the rule calls for a balanced approach of strategies that both address investment in place and mobility of people, um, and that is something that uh, is going to be extremely important for the city to address within its own fair housing process and one that we hope a revised version of this legislation will track indicators related to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Veronica Cook, and I'm a staff attorney in the Civil Rights Justice Initiative at Legal Services. I'm here with my colleague, Marika Diaz, uh, who's the director of our Tenants' Rights Coalition. Um, and I'm also here today as a member of the LSSA 2320, uh, which is our union that um, encompasses our staff members, our receptionists, our paralegals, our attorneys, all of our non-management staff at Legal Services. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We're uh, really grateful and really thrilled that you all are introducing these bills. Um, we've had the opportunity as well to meet with HPD on a couple of occasions and we're really glad that they're continuing uh, in their plan to conduct an assessment of fair housing despite the absence of an immediate federal mandate to do so. Um, and we think that the codification of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule um, and the requirement that the city perform um, or develop an affordable housing plan um, are excellent first steps in ensuring and fighting for fair and equitable housing opportunity in New York City, um, but they are just first steps. I want to um, echo and build upon comments that you all uh, have made, that uh, my previous, my colleagues here, um, that Banana Kelly made about um, acknowledging that affirmatively furthering fair housing is not just about integration um, and is not just about looking at um, areas that are predominantly white or higher income as areas of uh, economic opportunity um, and excluding or not considering the values uh, that are already present in neighborhoods that are um, lower income or predominantly made up of people of color. Um, there is particular language in the HUD rule that we think could be incorporated into intro 607 in particular. Um, and so, um, just to finish very quickly, um, there's language in the HUD rule about engaging in activities to remove barriers to the develop development of affordable housing in, high, in areas of high opportunity, targeted investment in neighborhood re revitalization and stabilization, promoting greater housing choice um, and greater access, and improving community assets. And we think some of that language could be incorporated into 607 as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Marika Diaz from Legal Services NYC. Hi. Um, I direct a citywide anti-harassment tenant protection program at Legal Services, and we're focused on neighborhoods that are facing rezoning and doing anti-displacement work in those neighborhoods. So, you know, through that work, we're really seeing firsthand the impacts. Frankly, in many neighborhoods, of the mere announcement of the creation of affordable housing through upzoning. Um, and so, you know, we really do welcome these bills. Um, right now is an opportunity to advance fair housing in our city, particularly at a time when, at a national level, um, we're seeing deterioration in that regard. And so, um, you know, we definitely um, want to commend um, the council members for, for addressing these gaps. Um, having said that, you know, obviously I reiterate the testimony of the Banana Kelly panel and, and my co-panelists here, um, where I wanted to sort of add on um, is simply to talk about um, the extent to which the bills 
require reporting from, from the city administration and we feel like a lot more could be done um, to give us a fuller picture of what's going on when we're talking about creating affordable housing. Um, and so, you know, one of the things about affordable housing creation through upzoning, which has really been the centrepiece of the, the affordable housing plan that we're seeing at the moment, um, one is that it has the potential for gentrification, displacement, resegregation potentially because of the affordability levels be being not what's required by the existing community members. Um, and so really a greater level of reporting could kind of get at that and allow us as a city to course correct when our affordable housing plans are actually just triggering displacement or actually not creating affordable housing. And so when I say that, I'm talking about things, you know, that are detailed in our testimony in writing, but things like requiring the administration to actually evaluate and report on the displacement that was triggered by rezoning actions and upzoning and the creation of affordable housing. Um, require, you know, requiring the, the administration to report on and evaluate secondary dis displacement in a way that like the secret tech manu technical manual doesn't get at, right? Um, requiring them to report on the preservation of the city's affordable housing stock in NYCHA and the alienation of NYCHA land to ostensibly create affordable housing but at levels, you know, as we've heard today, that maybe don't get at the levels of affordability needed in those communities. Um, and also requiring the administration to report on the preservation of the rent regulated housing stock that we have, which is in some ways, you know, our greatest, most permanent affordable housing stock and yet what we're hemorrhaging. And so we really think that additions like this could help, you know, better get at the kinds of issues that we think this legislation is intended to address. Thank you. Chair, uh, sorry, can I, can I just say one sentence? Yes. Sorry. So just to add on to one thing, I think one thing to highlight is um, the where we got to the Fa Fair Housing Act is because we're rooted in policies and practices that had structural racism and xenophobia in them. I think one thing also that we mentioned in our testimony and that's come up is that the data and analysis that w that is proposed in the bills and that we currently have also track things around housing units, but do not track how people are being, the, the actions that are happening to individuals, right? And I think that that is also an important piece to think about in this fair housing legislation that the council is considering. I might be able to pull up either now or in the future a bunch of information on ELI, VLI, various units, that does not mean that I will have the information on whether or not we are acting differently on black residents, Puerto Rican residents, Chinese residents, and that is part of, and disabled seniors, veterans, that is core to our Fair Housing Act and core to um, how New York City has approached fair housing that also we don't have and that isn't reflected in this. So actually, I look forward to working with you further to see how we could get to a better place with the legislation, especially through um, the data and, and, and subsets of data that would, would, would kind of equal the playing field, because that's obviously the intent. Um, and whatever we have to do to get there, uh, it's the right time to be attempting to do that. Questions? Thank you so much for your testimony and for your work on behalf of communities around the city. I'm going to call the uh, last panel for the day. Uh, Chinera Pierce, Tawaki Komatsu, Brother Paul Muhammad, and Albert Scott. Um, I would just like to note that uh, I'm very grateful that HVD has stayed around to hear the testimony of the last three panels. We truly appreciate that. So I have uh, three gentlemen and a lady, so I'm going to let protocol apply and chivalry to take place. Just please state your name. Shanara Pierce. Um, my name is Shanara Pierce. I'm the policy coordinator from the Fair Housing Justice Center here in New York City. The Fair Housing Justice Center, a regional civil rights organization based in New York City, strongly supports passage of local law, Intro 607, 
in Intro 601 with some modifications. In our view, the passage and implementation of these laws with some minor changes could, over time, enable New York City to gradually reduce residential racial segregation, decrease poverty concentration, and expand affordable housing opportunities um, throughout the city for populations whose um, housing choices have historically been limited. The enactment of these local laws would also establish a process that could aid the city to fulfill its duty to comply with the Federal Fair Housing Act by affirmatively furthering fair housing. We are just one day from commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act. That critical piece of historic legislation passed by Congress and signed into law one week after the assassination of Martin Luther King prohibited housing discrimination throughout our nation. It also included a key provision that the U.S. Uh, HUD and all recipients for federal funds implement all, all housing and community development activities in a manner that affirmatively furthers fair housing. Now, reflecting on the past five decades, it is clear that fair housing ha laws have not been vig vigorously enforced and the affirmatively further requirement has been largely ignored by the federal government as well as the recipients of federal funds. Worse yet, we are witnessing at the federal level outrageous actions that can only be described as regressively retreating from fair housing. The shameful rescinding of the, uh, of the AFH rule promulgated by the two, uh, under the Obama administration signals an unwillingness by the current administration to implement one of the most basic and important provisions of the civil rights law. In view of developments at the federal level, we do support Intro 607 because it is consistent with the spirit and letter of the Fair Housing Act and would hold New York City accountable to affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, Intro 607 only has meaning and value if the city's fair affordable housing plan, Intro 601, also captures and reports data in a manner that enables policymakers to readily assess whether any facet of the plan is in any neighborhood tabulation area area, uh, reducing or perpetuating residential racial segregation, reducing or increasing poverty concentration, and expanding or constraining housing choice. In our view, a fair housing affordable plan, uh, a fair and affordable housing plan would need to include for each neighborhood tabulation area, area data on e other factors such as race, national origin, income levels, age of existing residents, as well as the number of existing affordable housing units and publicly subsidized housing units in the area, including public housing units and the number of households with Section 8 subsidies and other rental subsidies. Additional information on schools, neighborhood amenities, recreational facilities, and other resources may be quite helpful in assessing whether specific areas are best locations for creating additional affordable housing. And my last point, for historically disadvantaged areas, it is, is there a comprehensive revitalization plan in place in which includes in, um, economic development in the form of commercial improvements, job creation, and evidence of private and, and public investment? The report also needs to include a data on any land use zoning and any other regulatory uh, barriers to creating or uh, preserving affordable housing beyond those factors listed in the proposed legislation. If this additional data is included as part of the plan that is mandated, we will, we will excuse me, fully support the legislation. Thank you. Th thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Tawaki Kamazu. I've testified at your meetings previously. Um, I'll try to be concise. Um, the following remarks appear in an email that I received from HRA's Paul Romain from its contracts division at 2.30 p.m. today. We were unable to get clearance for you at the Four World Trade 150 uh, Green Street. Accordingly, today's 4 p.m. meeting has to be rescheduled for another date and time. We will let you know as soon as we find another location fit to view the draft contract. That was about a, a confirmed appointment for me to go to Four World Trade at 4 p.m. today to view a contract, a proposed contract um, to be issued to Urban Pathways that I discussed with you that has embezzled ta taxpayer cash. The proposed contract is for $10 million. Um, so essentially, my equal, equal protection rights were violated today, and I'm going to take that up in court. So let me move on to the next So, so wait, Mr. Kamaso, I, I want to um, just briefly, you've, you've testified at several of my hearings, yes. and, and, and I um, 
have asked that you would meet directly with my staff because I, I realize that you are having some issues around housing that can only be addressed not in hearing, but to meet individually with my staff. I want to encourage I you to do that. I them. They haven't followed up. Okay, so I want to encourage you to, to do that today. My chief of staff is right over there. But let I, me move on to the rest of the testimony. Is it is it pertinent to it is. what would the fair, fair housing? Has, uh, okay, is. thank you. So today's uh, hearing is about fair housing, civil rights, affordable housing. So on March 27th, I asked the mayor if he could get legal representation for a woman who's in housing court today to try to prevail against a slumlord I'd previously beat in housing court. Um, she was actually in housing court against a judge who illegally evicted me from my apartment in Queens for which I asked for legal representation uh, from HRA to try to have me restored to possession of my former apartment. That hasn't happened. Instead, HRA has partner, partnered with the same judge who illegally evicted me from my own apartment. So can you do something about that? Yeah, as soon as you're done with your testimony, my chief I'm of staff is, right, is still here. So I'd like for you to, to step to the side and just speak with her privately because we need to resolve some of your issues uh, going forward. And I think we can only do that with a one-on-one. -on -one. So she's, she's here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Scott. I'm chairman and CEO of the Homeowners Association in East New York and also affiliated with the Coalition for Community Advancement for Cypress Hills, East New York. Um, first, let me, I would like to do is, um, we would like to applaud the council for commemorating the 50 year anniversary of the Fair Housing Act by introducing a series of bills intended to ensure that New York City affirmatively furthers their fair housing on that end. Um, we would also like to state that the, uh, city the city's obligation to affirmatively further fair housing covers all housing actors, funding, and policies that impact a protected class, individual, community, and neighborhood. Um, our obligation to ensure fair housing is not limited to affordable housing development. Um, we ask that the city council also introduce legislation that further fair housing in all aspects and types of housing for all actors. Uh, we ask that the city council introduce and or expand the legislation to include the fair housing impact of additional protected classes, including religion, age, and source of income, et cetera. Uh, we ask that the city council require an assessment of how the city, city's overarching housing market and housing plan are disproportionately impacting uh, our protected uh, class. For example, uh, what is the impact of luxury housing units on senior and racial or ethnic groups and uh, family size, et cetera. But most importantly, we ask the city council require an assessment of how the current housing market, including all market rate, affordable, and land use based housing plans, policies, and programs impact historically disenfranchised people and those who historically and currently face explicit and implicit discrimination, which just le lead me to a, an example out in East New York, which was recently uh, rezoned. Um, just a quick second. The, on Liberty, on the corner of Liberty and Ashford in, within the rezoned area, um, in the plan it stated that HPD would, for example, will track whether um, developments within this specific rezone area would actually, uh, whether they will be able to opt in or opt out of the MIH program, meaning that monies will be dispersed, they could either pay out or they uh, work, go along with the program. On this specific property on Liberty and Ashford within the heart of the rezone area, uh, we still don't know a, a how much money, what's the formula of what that particular project has to contribute to the fund, one. And then number two, what is the formula, whether it's from if they intend to build 30 units, 10 units, or 50 units? Is it the same lump sum money which is contributed? And then what is the processes um, and how is it reported back to the city council on how those monies are then distributed back within the local district of um, East New York on that end. So I applaud these strategies as far as the reporting efforts, but also look at the mechanisms on how the task agencies will be reporting back that information to you and how, especially how the monies will be disseminated throughout the rezone districts. So, so that's a very clear and concise question and uh, the members of HPD have stated, if, if you could answer that, 
not publicly, but if you could, when, when you leave, just pass by and, and, and have it and, and follow up with them. And if you're not satisfied, okay. um, both uh, myself and your council member Espino. Will, will follow up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Brother Paul Muhammad. I'm on the Community Board 5 uh, Land Use Committee. I'm the Chair of Public Safety and Community Board 5. I'm also on the Board of other uh, institutions uh, in Community Board 5, the Health and Hospital Facility of Picking, Pennsylvania, and I'm on the Coalition for Community Advancement. Uh, we, we found, and I'm, we've testified here before the actual rezoning of East New York, so we're more here, and I'm with the points that my comrade here put, but I want to go to two of the specific points in this report that we put before you. Dealing with the fact of the assessment of the impact, um, let me read this here, you got to get these glasses on. We asked that the city council require an assessment of how the city's over, overreach, overarching housing market and housing plan are disproportionately impacting and be protected classes. Right there, uh, we brought up in 2015, pre-Trump, pre the vote in this city council that uh, we we talk, we actually said that it would be a a, a grave injustice to the folks there because I want to give the picture. We're here talking about Martin Luther King and the 1968 Fair Housing Act, and um, really we've done a disservice to his memory. We bring him up every year. We resurrect what he did, but we don't stand on what he did all the other, all the other, you know, for the last 50 years. He was not a drum major for freedom. He was a drum major for justice. We have lost the fight for the fight for justice. I think I, I see, and Mr. Carnegie, can you chair, Mr. Carnegie, I know in your neighborhood what's happening, bed -Stuy. I was just with 50 churches last week. We're talking about reclaiming the prophetic voice at Bethany Baptist Church. And we found that the fact over 400 churches have moved from downtown Brooklyn and, and out of bed -Stuy because they're being ran out. If the churches are gone, the constituents are gone. The constituents can't stay, the church can't live. So we really, it's, a, it's really a question of our moral commitment to the fact that we believe in justice or are we really talking about an economic uh, social engineering policies that have affected our people. I want to say to you in East New York that I, my family, I'm, I'm a 50 year example of what happened. When my family moved in 1968 to East New York. We bought into the Fair Housing Act. They were burning buildings and they're moving out. Blacks moved in, it was white flight. We bought the houses, we built the neighborhood. We endured heroin, crack, cocaine, and crime. And we were disenfranchised. We weren't invested in that, but we stayed. Now what I found out, we, it's more like we've had deceit, deception. Now we're facing displacement. So what we had, we bought in, we bought homes, we went over there. These, this law was not protected. It should have been brought, it should have been a, a, uh, a lawsuit brought on behalf of the residents of East New York because our own Scott Stringer said 50,000 of the present residents of East New York would be displaced if that rezoning went through. They were saying that, six, I said on the meeting, they said 67,000 new residents were coming. Not 67,000 new residents, 67,000 new residents. See, we, we have to study the language. Gentrification has nothing to do with the fact that what's really going on. You're replacing one ethnic group with another, and that's ethnic cleansing. I see more people coming in that don't look like me. I see the people who look like me. I've stayed in my family's own property for 50 years, and I bought another property here. I have children that are born into the concept of living in a house. I have to tell them now to get in a lot for a house. Who said we wanted uh, density? Who said we wanted 14-story buildings in our community? We are a colony. We're being dictated what we want in our community by somebody else. That's against the whole principle that Martin Luther King stood on. So as we come here today to talk about the Fair Housing Act, and so get back to the spirit of what it was built in. What came, blood went into these streets behind the Fair Housing Act. People died to fight for the right to have self-determination. We have our communities, we fought to stay there. These policies that are being put in place do not go to the core of the racist institutional policies that pervade in this city. And until we address that issue, building in our community, it's just gonna, you're gonna move us out, this place is, I'm a homeowner, and I'll finish on this. I was talking about this, Section 8 right now is now being subject to fair market rents. I house people, nobody's helped me. HPD did not come to me with a plan to preserve my housing. I have a three-family house and I have a two-family house. I provide affordable rents for the folks there, but I can't now. Aggressive water lien sales, foreclosure sales, my property taxes going on. The average age of a homeowner in the East New York is 58 years old, black and Latino. That's the Democrat so far of this date. 
So if you're going to tell me a violation of the Fair Housing Act, there it is. It caused an adverse, disproportionate impact on any race, and that's what it caused. And Scott Springer said it in 2015, but this city council voted yes on it, 44 to 1. Tell me who was talking about fair housing then. All I heard, you got to watch the devil with the narrative. The narrative then was affordable housing. Nobody was talking about fair housing and the skewed AMI of this city. The average people in East New York and Browns are going to make 30 the $31,000 a year. The AMI in New York City is $86,000 a year. You're not building in Westchester. We've got this thing all backwards. Why are you killing Westchester in the AMI of New York City, but you're not building there, but you're building in Brownsville in East New York? Somebody's doing a lie here. So we got to tell the truth. This is a hand behind this, and it's economic racism. So you, you could see it easy back in the 60s. George Romney, Mitt Romney's father, he said that the suburbs, when he was talking, when he was the HUD chair under Nixon, he said the suburbs are white noose around urban America. See, we've got this thing all backwards. And there's another book I'll leave you. You need to take a look at what helped found it, the whole policies behind this uh, Civil Rights Act. And that was an act. Gunnard Maidrol, I think he was a Swedish Nobel laureate. He wrote a book in 1944 that is a foundation, and it's a 1,500-page treatise funded by uh, the Carnegie, and it's called in America. Hold on, let's be clear. C Carnegie. Carnegie, sorry. Not Carnegie. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Carnegie. Right. But the book is called An American, Dil he said American, An American Dilemma, the Negro Problem in Modern Day. No, we are, we were seen as a problem. And that book did 100,000 re and re back the reprint in the 60s. We don't understand what we're looking at here it's an economic attack on the people that are sitting on very valuable land, but are poor people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, that, you. You said you have that report. I don't have it for my, we'll, my record. We'll send a report to you. Okay. You All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Mr. Kamatsu, can you please just check in with my staff so we can schedule a date to sit down? And for the record, uh, New York City Community Land Initiative has submitted testimony. And we are going to close this hearing at this time. Thank you so much.